Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program Wolves in the West. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme, and this month's theme is wild. So of course, my first thought was wolves. Our presenter tonight is retired wolf biologist Dick Thiel, who's made a career as a biologist and wildlife educator. In 1980, he was hired as Wisconsin's first wolf biologist, creating and managing Wisconsin's wolf recovery program for a decade. He then worked in wildlife education for 30 year, 33 years while simultaneously being responsible for the Department of Natural Resources wolf monitoring activities within Wisconsin's Central Forest region from the time wolves first colonized there in 1994 to 95. Dick retired 10 years ago and continues to work as a board member and in wildlife education talking about wolves. He's also an author and has a remarkable bio that I had to just stop. So <laughs> I'm so pleased that you could join us, Dick Thiel, and talk to us about wolves. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to load this up and we'll hope that everybody can see this. So first off, I want to say thank you for inviting me to um, provide a little information about wolves. Um, I'm from the upper Midwest and I've had plenty of experience working here. Uh, there's not a lot of wolf biologists in the world and as a scientist we tend to collaborate and share ideas and join in research projects. So while I've worked mostly here in the upper Midwest, I certainly am aware of what's going on out in the West and have had small occasions to work out in Montana and a few other places as well. So I've been dabbled with wolves out there, but uh, my foundation is here. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about wolves. And what I'd like to do today is divide it between um, a number of things. The first thing I always start out with is a uh, kind of a natural history primer so that we can set the record straight in terms of what we do know about wolves. And I want to mention that as a scientist, I'm going to be providing scientific information. Um, and so I'm going to be drawing from a, a pretty good um, amount of, of information that, that uh, scientists have, have basically learned over the last 50 years about wolves. I would like to then move out to the West paint a little picture of the environment in the, in the western United States, west of the 100th meridian, uh, from about um, uh, the time of European contact to 1880. Look at the extermination of wolf period, which really ran from about 1880 to 1930 in the west. Then I'm going to look at uh, and bring you along with me on the federal recovery period, which ran from about uh, the mid-70s to about 2010. And I'm going to paint a little picture of contemporary management as it exists uh, in the states uh, in the West that actually have wolves. So that's where I hope to bring you tonight. So we're going to just get along right now with it. So the first thing I want to do is talk about natural history. Wolves are in the dog family, which we call the Canidae. And the Canidae is very well represented in North America, and it consists of foxes, coyotes, wolves, and also dogs. The three latter ones, coyotes, wolves, and dogs, are in the genus Canis, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The foxes um, are scattered about their own genuses, and they're, while they are in the canid family, they're not really closely related to the wolves and the coyotes and the dogs. Um, but in any event, uh, we include them because they're, they're the members of the dog family are found in North America. Gray wolf distribution has changed in the world in the last uh, four centuries. Uh, originally, they were found north of latitude 23, which is roughly somewhere around Mexico City, across central India and the Old World. And they're what we call circumpolar, meaning that they were distributed across the entire world uh, in the northern latitudes. This is a northern adapted species for the most part. And uh, their range has receded quite a bit in the last uh, two or three centuries uh, based on uh, the animosity and persecution they've received from human beings. So that mustard colored area is areas where they've been wiped out by humans and the purplish colored areas are the areas that they're still found. I wanna talk a little bit about the physical, what this animal really is. Uh, so the color phases of this animal can be highly variable. They can range from gray to red to white. Black individuals are certainly not unknown. Uh, so there's a large 
color variation that can exist and sometimes even in one litter. They are actually not sexually mature until they're just shy of two years of age. And most adults, meaning they have to be two years of age uh, to be an adult, will weigh somewhere between 70 and 125 pounds. And I'm generalizing, there are some that are larger and I've seen many that have been smaller than that. Um, so there's a lot of variability even with body stature, body weight. What's really unique uh, about wolves is that they are the largest of the wild dogs. There's nothing that is bigger than them other than actually domesticated dogs. Some breeds uh, are larger than them, but in terms of wild dogs, this is the largest, the gray wolf. The hunting style that they use or employ to try and get food is uh, what we call a courser, meaning that they're actually actively out looking for and trying to make contact with prey, as opposed to, for instance, the cat family, which are ambush predators, meaning they select a space they think is good and they conceal themselves and they wait. So the two styles of predatory behaviors between these two groups of predators is, is vastly different. Because wolves are coursers, and indeed all the canids are, they are built for endurance. Wolves will typically walk at a pace of about five miles an hour, and they can run at 35 miles an hour, and they can do this uh, fairly extensively. I've seen wolves running at that speed through two feet of snow for 45 minutes. Uh, so they have incredible endurance. They're just built for moving. There's actually a Russian fable that says the wolf is kept fed by its feet. And that certainly is an apt description of them. They have very well developed senses of smell, hearing, and they have good day and night vision. Their sense of smell is the manner in which they uh, view their world. Uh, we human beings, uh, uh, by contrast, view our world through our sense of sight. Uh, most mammals actually use their nose more than they do their eyes. And the wolf's sense of smell is actually superb. And we, we have done studies on them, but in science, the, the sense of smell is something that's really elusive. Um, and we borrow from the dog literature uh, kind of as a pseudo to, to imagine what the wolf's world is like, but their sense of smell is very, very acute. And uh, their sense of hearing is very good. It's pretty similar to that of a human. And as opposed to humans, which have exceptionally day, good day vision uh, and very lousy night vision, wolves have, have a good compatibility between day and night vision. The main prey of wolves are what we call ungulates. And the word ungulate really means it's an animal, usually a large animal, whose legs end in hooves. And so the wild prey of wolves in North America ranges in size from the diminutive white-tailed deer and mule deer to the massive bison and musk oxen of the far north and everything in between. And so these are the animals that they focus on. The problem for wolves, however, is that as a predator, they're seeking out animals that are actually larger than themselves. For instance, when they're uh, chasing after moose, uh, that moose typically is going to weigh 10 times the, the uh, individual weight of a, of a wolf chasing it. And so they're at a big disadvantage uh, when they're seeking out prey like this, and yet this is what they're adapted to do. Wolves live in families, and families are nothing more than a breeding male and a breeding female. They have uh, offspring every year. Generally speaking, in the latitudes that you exist in Oregon and here in Wisconsin, wolves pups are being born in about the middle of April. So they will have a litter of about five or six pups, and not all of those pups are going to survive to even see their first birthday. Those that do are what we call yearlings, and some of those yearlings will also die before they meet their second birthday, but those that are lucky enough to survive long enough, ultimately those yearlings will mostly disperse. In other words, what we mean by that is they will leave the family in which they are born. They'll leave the natal pack, and they'll go out traveling and trying to seek out uh, an animal of the opposite sex and sufficient space with which to start a, a family of their own. Occasionally we see 
some of these yearlings lag behind and basically become extra adults in, in the pack. This is somewhat rare, but it's, it's uh, something that we do see often enough. Productivity of wolves and reproduction. As I've already mentioned, most of the pups are born in mid-April. Average pack, uh, litter size is between five and six pups. They usually seek out some type of a structure. They'll either dig a hole in the ground or usurp an old beaver lodge from which the uh, dam has, has uh, broken apart, leaving it high and dry. Sometimes they'll um, usurp a fox den and enlarge it. Uh, and so they will den, uh, and this is where the pups are normally born. They'll stay in that den until they're about five to six, to maybe eight weeks, in which case uh, by then they're, they're getting large enough, and they come up above ground, and uh, then they occupy what we call a series of rendezvous sites, which are the same thing as a home site or a nursery. And these will be occupied by the pack until uh, May to September in many cases. This is about the time of year, the autumn of the year, is when the yearlings begin to, their dispersal. And most yearlings will disperse between about October and March of the year, just prior to the time when they're two years old. Some of them, as I said, obviously stay behind on occasion, but most of these animals have the yearning to, to be a, a wanderer. So the movements of wolf packs uh, within their respective territories really is dependent upon the season and the, the uh, state of development of the pups. During the summer months between the denning season in April and when the rendezvous sites are occupied up until about September, the adults will, will basically move like spokes on a wheel coming to and from where the pups are stashed. And they do this for almost five or six months out of the year. And they're provisioning the pups because they go out and forage. Most of the time when they're foraging, they're doing it in singles or pairs. And uh, when they get food, and it typically is going to be an animal larger than themselves, they will consume as much of that as they can. And we know based on studies that wolves can pack upwards of 20 pounds of meat into their stomach at a time. They will walk back to the rendezvous site where they are greeted by the pups and they uh, regurgitate the food. So the stomach in this case is actually uh, a food bag. And uh, the, the adults and the yearlings are pretty well stressed during the summer months because every time they go out uh, and come back, they're going to lose a meal. And so uh, they tend to be thinner during the summer months than they do during the winter months because of this kind of a, a situation. They're putting on a lot of miles on those paws at that time of year. By the time you get into October, November, uh, the wolf uh, pups are big enough to be basically you travel with their parents and maybe the oddball yearling that's still around. And so they start traveling with the pack. And that's when you see kind of those pictures of a, a pack of wolves walking single file through the snow. Um, they, they basically wander through their territory and it's very decision based and their strategies that are involved and they're seeking out prey. And if they make a kill, it may take them two or three days to consume it all. And keep in mind, there are other things out there that will try to provision themselves if the wolves slip away for a, for a little while to sleep off uh, a meal. And so anything from chickadees to stellar's jays to, uh, in some cases, in some areas of the West, grizzly bears um, will um, consume some of that. And we call those animals activity scavenging. Uh, and so the wolves tend to stay near the kill and uh, they, they, come and go kind of like you and I do uh, in Thanksgiving where we just keep on going back to the turkey carcass whether it's on the dinner table or in the refrigerator afterwards uh, and they'll eat pretty much everything until it's almost gone and then they resume this same pattern of movement. Now we talked a little bit about dispersers and there's several types of dispersers. Some of these animals actually can find space in a mate fairly close to their natal pack. But in some cases, some of these animals, for reasons we don't understand, are what we call long distance dispersers or jump dispersers, as um, some of my colleagues in Poland name them. These animals can go great distances. And this map, uh, which was generated in 2014 and is actually kind of dated already, shows some of the records of some of the jump dispersers that have moved from some of the populations with, with, uh, with wolves. The upper Midwest, which is where I'm from, 
uh, is, is a population that basically reestablished itself. The last wolf population in the United States of America back in the 1960s was actually limited to the northeast corner of Minnesota. And that population has spread back into Wisconsin and upper Michigan since then. And the manner in which they did so was through jump dispersing. So this, these lines that you see are just indications of, of how these animals move about. And, and they can move about rather rapidly. Wolves, they're born, but they're all going to die at some point. That's kind of a given in, in life. No matter what organism you are, you're born and, and you will die. And so sources of mortality that we look at as wildlife biologists are divided between natural sources and human sources. Uh, wolves um, are, are susceptible, susceptible to a, a couple of viral diseases. There are certain parasites that can be pretty nasty. Wolves actually kill wolves. And then wolves, like all other animals, uh, die from accidents. I've had radioed wolves in my study areas that have drowned. I've had uh, colleagues uh, whose wolves have been killed by prey, the, the very animals they're trying to seek a dinner from. And then there are human sources. And the human sources um, are divided between illegal shootings against the law Vehicles, a lot of wolves get killed trying to cross roads. Depredation control, and also in some states, uh, harvests uh, through legal hunting. What's really interesting, no matter where wolf biologists have studied wolves, you can see in this chart, um, the locations are highly variable. Uh, and I've even included a couple of places in Europe. Uh, the mortality rate or the number of percent of, of wolves that are dying each year is about 25% per year. That means if you have a pack of four wolves without any reproduction next year at this time, it'll be down to three wolves. So about one quarter of the wolf population in any year uh, dies from one of these various causes. Human cause mortality is all over the board and it depends upon whether uh, an area hunts them or there's illegal kills or lots of roads and vehicle kills. Um, the two areas that are highlighted in red represent uh, national parks. And even in most of our national parks, wolves do die at the hands of humans. The only place in the world that I'm actually aware of where there is no human caused mortality is on Isle Royale National Park in the middle of Lake Superior, uh, which is considered a part of the state of Michigan. I always, when I do these talks, I have people always asking me, how old do wolves get? It's a really difficult question to answer because when we catch a wolf in a trap or we helicopter net them, um, they don't come with a birth certificate in their back pocket. And so trying to age a wolf is very difficult. We have some little um, uh, manners in which we can estimate that. But the best method is to try and catch some pups and then follow their, their lives uh, as, as it unfolds. The problem, of course, is um, you can't really collar a pup because their neck isn't expanded to the point where it can hold a collar that would be adult size. And so this is a frustration for a lot of us biologists, but there have been a few studies that have demonstrated this, and I'm picking two, one in Denali National Park in Alaska and one, my very own one in the central part of Wisconsin. And when I plotted these two together, I was really surprised how similar they were, despite the fact that there's a wide geographic region between Alaska and Wisconsin. The majority of wolves, no matter where we study them, usually die between about two and four years of age. So the majority of wolves are dead by the time they reach sexual maturity. Um, the, the animals that actually make that are actually suffering at high mortality rates anyhow. And so most breeding wolves in each of these packs probably is only going to breed between one and three times in their life. Uh, and their life is over. It's a short and it's a fast life because what they're doing, trying to catch animals larger than themselves, is a very dangerous game and this is what they've evolved to do and this is what they do and these are some of the repercussions of, of that kind of uh, a lifestyle. I've already mentioned that wolves have territories but what most people don't realize is 
Uh, the definition of a territory means that this space is defended against others of their own kind. They also defend that space against coyotes, and they will actually defend it against dogs. And so uh, this defense of territory is actually carried out by all members of the pack. It's not just a single animal. It's the entire pack. They know the boundaries. Uh, they patrol those boundaries while they're coursing, looking for prey. And if they encounter an intruder, oftentimes, uh, if they're able to catch it, they will kill it. And this is one of the areas where wolves get into trouble with human beings, because in most places where wolves occur in the world today, there are rural residences, many of which keep dogs. And so uh, while the majority of wolves tend to just ignore those dogs, uh, in some cases, something goes awry and a dog gets snatched off a porch. Um, and so this is an area, it's just part of what wolves are. And this is an area um, where we get into conflict with wolves or wolves get into conflict with us. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Wolves, uh, in order to maintain a wolf population, you need three things. You need the availability they need an available source of, of ungulates or deer or moose or elk. They need to be able to move along corridors so that there is gene flow amongst these dispersers. And then they also require tolerance on the part of the local human population. And this is the one that is the most, um, most um, um, uh, tenable with regards to wolves because in most places people are totally intolerant to wolves and as we've learned from history, which we're going to learn again in a moment, um, we've managed to wipe them out pretty much the entire United States of America, south of Canada and Mexico. And so um, this is the thing that we wolf biologists look at. And it's one reason why I try to educate people about wolves is that there's a lot of misinformation and actually disinformation about wolves and uh, um, trying to educate people about wolves to learn what they are. Uh, might help improve some of the toleration of them. So now I'm going to explain what happened in the West. The West is a very complex place, west of about the 100th meridian, which is roughly you know, west of, of the, the Missouri River where it starts trending north out of Missouri. Um, we have the coastal mountain ranges, we have the basin and ranges, we have the Rockies, and we have the Great Plains. So half of the United States of America is encompassed by these general physiographic regions and all of this was home to wolves as was the eastern part of of the united states so we know as scientists that wolves are what we call habitat generalists they can live anywhere where there are ungulates and uh, where people leave them alone so what happened to the wolves out west only took about 50 years. And what I've done here is I'm kind of showing you a proxy to a Euro European, European American settlement. Of course, there were indigenous peoples throughout the entire North American continent and their values towards wolves um, was differed between the various tribes. Many of the tribes in, in my area revere the wolves. Some of the tribes in the west uh, either had very little experience with them or actually uh, didn't particularly like them. Uh, but many of them certainly uh, have a reverence and a spiritual connection with wolves. Uh, and so their viewpoints towards wolves was decidedly different from that of the Europeans. As the Europeans marched across the continent, um, that kind of shows what happened to the wolves. So I'm going to click this button and you're going to see by decade how each state, when each state was declared uh, a part of the state, the, uh, the United States of America, when it gained statehood. And so you're going to see this proceed by the decades, and you'll see this pattern of how wolves were basically just swallowed up. Um, and the last of the wolves in the West were actually killed off in the 1940s down along the Mexican border. What augmented this was the fact that as this place was depopulated by game, animals such as elk and, and uh, bison, uh, in came the cattle. And cattle basically occupied much of the, of the Western United States by the early 1880s. Um, wolfers became very active, especially on the Great Plains by the late 1860s, right at the conclusion of the Civil War. And they started using a poison which had just been 
uh, developed and mass manufactured, and it was called strychnine. Uh, the problem with strychnine is that um, it creates what we call secondary poisoning. So you lace a carcass with poison, those wolves or those jays or those golden eagles eat it, they die, which is the objective, of course. Their carcass lays there, another jay comes along or a coyote comes along and eats it, it too dies. And so you have what we call secondary poisoning. And so by use of strychnine, most of the West was basically depopulated predators. By 1900, the most common hoofed mammal on Western ranges was not elk, and it certainly wasn't bison, it was actually cattle. And so what wolves were left were relegated to basically eating off of, of uh, the ranchers' uh, livelihoods. The last probable wolf breeding records for each of the states um, is, is shown here. And in your neck of the woods in Oregon, in Washington, and also in neighboring Idaho, uh, the last uh, wolf packs that actually bred were probably wiped out by the early 1930s. We really can't find any suggestion in the historical records that wolves lasted much longer than that. Uh, there were a few ranges in east central Idaho, or I'm sorry, um, Utah, and then again along the Mexican border where they persisted a little longer. But in any event, they were pretty much gone uh, by around 1930. The last absolute records that I've been able to find in looking through as many historical records as I could get my hands on kind of also shows this. And these are the last individual animals that states had records for. If you look at that little legend in the lower left corner, you can see by decade, circle 1920s, square 1930s, triangle 1940s, where the last of these animals were taken in the respective states out west. And, uh, and so you can see that these ranges were literally depopulated uh, of wolves, uh, certainly by no later than the, the 30s. The only wolves left uh, after the 1930s that were breeding were in the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And because there were bounties going on in all three of these states, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan lost their wolves by the 1950s, leaving Minnesota as the sole state in the United States of America south of Canada where wolves then occurred. There was a, an awakening of sorts, uh, an environmental movement. Those of you that are as old as me would remember the very interesting decade of the 1960s. In addition to protesting the Vietnam War, uh, there were protests for the environment and women's rights and some of these things are rather interesting to me today because we're still doing the same things. But an outgrowth of the environmental movement was the passage of the Endangered Species Act and this is federal. So the Federal Endangered Species Act was passed in 1974. It essentially listed the gray wolf as endangered nationwide. And in 1978, they revised that uh, by placing the wolves in Minnesota on the federal threatened list, elsewhere they remained endangered. And so this is the template, if you will, for which wolf restoration occurred in subsequent decades. Now wolf management, no matter where it occurs, is a balance between trying as a wildlife manager to maintain a population, in other words, assure that it's viable, viable meaning that it's functioning okay and there's no problems that we could see in the future where it could become extinct or endangered. And we have to balance that against the conflicts that an animal species uh, creates. And that balance is, is often a, a very tenuous job with regards to any species. Um, all of the ungulates, for instance, create damage to agricultural interests, uh, deer, pronghorn, elk. Um, and so any species that we wildlife managers work with has its, its downside, if you will. Uh, with regards to wolves, there's several downsides. And we look in the realm of, you know, its impact on livestock. And we have to look at its impact on, on big game populations. And of course, the age old concern, which is largely unfounded, which I'll explain in a little while, is uh, elements of human safety. So with regards to statistics uh, out west, uh, this kind of shows you the number of, of uh, animals that have been taken by wolves on cattle ranges in, in about five of the states out west. I was able to go into Department of Ag, 
both state and federal Department of Ag records and go into wolf reports from the various states and uh, extract this kind of data in 2016. And what we're looking at really is the fact that um, while wolves depredate cattle and when they do depredate cattle and sheep, it is a cause for concern and, and it impacts the livelihoods of the ranchers. Um, when you look at the broad picture, um, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of, of animals that are out there and the other sources of loss and mortality that occurs. Um, so in any event, in many cases, a lot of the depredation issues surrounding wolves is, is somewhat overblown. And again, I don't want to uh, uh, belittle the fact that if you're a producer and you're losing animals to these, you know, to wolves, that is a problem. So we're going to address that issue in a moment as well. So all the states have um, control programs for wolves, and each of the states are uh, regulated in different ways. Uh, there are a bunch of things in the, the control agent's toolbox. Some of them involve non-lethal actions, and some of them are lethal. Uh, so with regards to some of the non-lethal uh, actions, fladry, which sounds really weird, but you string up uh, flagging tape on uh, around a fence, uh, like say in a sheep fold or something like that, uh, the waving of those those things in the breeze actually scare wolves. Um, guard animals can be effective. Donkeys in particular are pretty aggressive. Uh, range riders are employed uh, in several places out west, including in Oregon. Um, None of these non-lethal actions are a, a fail-safe, foolproof way of, of basically eliminating depredations. They can diminish them. In some cases, it can eliminate the problem in the current year, but in the next year, you're going to have to readdress the issue in all probability. And so some of these things are, are, are while they work temporarily and even sometimes in local areas uh, pretty permanently, they're not 100% uh, uh, effective. Lethal removal of depredating wolves in the five states um, based on these years shows the number of animals that have been taken. Um, and so this is a manner in which animals are taken. They're basically removed, they're killed uh, to try and eliminate the problem. Some of the issues around surrounding killing the wolves is that we have some studies that actually suggest that by disrupting a pack, you create more breeding females who create more litters. Um, and that's not in every place, but there is some suggestion in some areas that um, in some cases, this can actually exacerbate the problem rather than, than uh, uh, address the issue. But in any event, um, most times when there's lethal removal, there is a remedy uh, for two, three or four years uh, and then possibly you get uh, some more uh, wolves taking cattle. Um, in my area, I have seen packs of wolves that have behaved for 20 years, despite the fact that their territories are on farms. And we farm, we don't ranch here in Wisconsin. On the other hand, I have some packs of wolves that notoriously um, you know, take cattle, uh, mostly calves, every year. And so the behavior of these animals um, is, is very individual. The behavior of these packs can be very individual. And, and that adds to some of the frustration for the producers. It certainly adds to some of the frustration if you're the wildlife manager trying to mitigate some of these issues that, that, are, are, that are generated by having wolves around. So remember that state management plans um, vary out west as they do here in the Midwest, but they do address depredating wolves. Um, in most cases, the government agents um, are authorized to remove livestock to predators. And uh, in some states, citizens are also allowed to shoot wolves that are caught in the act of killing. It just varies between state and state in terms of what, what is uh, permissible. With regards to wolves and big game animals, uh, this, is a, this is an area where there's a lot of work being done. A couple of points to make is that wolves are what we call uh, risk averse. They're very selective. They don't want to get themselves into a tangle with an animal um, and uh, and basically get injured or killed because that is of no value to them. And so they're very selective. And with regards to elk, no matter where uh, they're studied, 
Uh, Idaho has been one area, and Yellowstone is another area, and parts of Montana in recent years uh, have been uh, have been producing some pretty good studies on wolves and their impact on elk. Uh, we find that um, that wolves are very selective. They seek out calves and they seek out elderly elk because these are the age groups that actually pose lower risks of injury to themselves. Um, and humans, on the other hand, are highly selective for the prime age animals, the very ones that wolves are avoiding. Because, of course, humans are looking for large body mass. This uh, chart that you see, I know some of you probably don't like charts and maybe have an aversion to science, but it shows uh, the age distribution of, of uh, cow elk that are killed by both hunters and wolves on what we call the northern range of Yellowstone National Park. And here in that part of the park, the, the elk summer in the park and they winter in adjacent uh, national forest lands in Montana and there are, are uh, hunting seasons uh, as soon as they step out of the national park for both actually elk as well as wolves. But in any event, um, what it shows is in the orange bars, there is the age uh, that are selected by hunters and the age in blue bars selected by wolves. And you can see that they're totally different. Um, and what's rather interesting, and I didn't want to confound you and have your eyes crossed, is that um, we know that elk, by the time they get to be anywhere from about 11 to 13 years of age, cow elk uh, start losing the ability to become impregnated. Uh, we call that fecundity, and the fecundity rates actually start dropping by about the 12th year. And so what wolves are selecting for are these elderly animals that are, are not ca as capable of defending themselves as prime age animals are. Um, and by chance, those animals also are the ones that are less likely to produce calves. So some rather interesting dynamics that go on as long as uh, we have the opportunity to look at it and, and kind of cipher through this stuff, we're learning more about what wolves do. We're certainly learning what humans do. And we even have studies going on with cougars uh, to show what they do. Uh, the bottom line is that in most places, there are no wolves in the West. In places where there are wolves, they're just another predator out there. And wildlife managers just have to account for them. There are state managed wolf hunts. And uh, in, most of the, the uh, um, areas uh, in uh, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, they became available for hunting in 2010 when the federal government essentially delisted wolves. Uh, Idaho and Montana have held hunts yearly since 2011. Wyoming's hunt was closed in 2014 to 2017, but has resumed. And in your neighboring state to the north in Washington, there are a couple of Indian reservations that have small seasons and they're regulated by those tribes. Uh, basically, this chart shows that somewhere around 350 wolves are taken, 200, 350 wolves are taken in both Idaho and in uh, Montana. Uh, Wyoming is just now starting to fire up, uh, and so that data will be coming in. But these harvests, if they're scientifically regulated, um, still basically allow for recreational opportunities to harvest wolves uh, but also preserve wolves or conserve them so that there are enough left to reproduce and, and carry on the population. We're going to then look lastly at wolves and humans, the little red riding hood syndrome, syndrome as I, I call it. And usually when I give these talks, um, I'm not accustomed to talking about people being prey of wolves um, because wolves just don't recognize humans as prey. I don't know why many of us wolf file to shake our heads at this because, I mean, if they can pull down an elk, they could sure pull down a human. Um, but there's very, very few records of wolves ever doing that uh, in North America. Um, they can scare you quite a bit because uh, occasionally uh, if you're in the, uh, you, you're hiking or something like that and you're, you approach a rendezvous site, Wolves will defend their pups. Um, and the manner in which they do that is they'll closely approach you and they may commence barking. Wolves, as opposed to dogs, don't bark. It's not in their lexicon. But when they do bark, it's a threat and it's a warning. Um, it's never been followed up by an attack, but 
The barking is rather forceful sounding and formidable. Believe me, I know because I've worked with wolves my entire career. And there have been times when I have accidentally bumped into a rendezvous site and uh, have had wolves start barking at me. It's only maybe two or three times in my life, but um, I know what it is. I know what they're doing and, uh, and I'm still alive. Um, in the past 120 years, we've only had two wolf caused fatalities in North America. Uh, we've had about 20 attacks in which people have been uh, injured. Um, most of the time these involve habituated wolves that are just have lost their fear of, of humans and may not have approach behaviors, but they just lost their fear. Bold animals, uh, we differentiate from habitual because they've, they've not only lost their fear of people, but they are using approach behaviors. Um, the manner in which wolves lose that fear of humans is probably through food rewards. And so there, it's kind of like a campground bear situation. It doesn't happen often, um, but when it does, um, state agencies, federal agencies usually react rather quickly because we don't want anything to happen. And so um, these things tend to be very, very rare. And I've always told people that if you feel concerned or you feel threatened about a wolf, whether it's actually truly behaviorally threatening you or not, um, the thing that you should do is to very slowly retreat. Um, keep your eyes on the wolf, but don't look them in the eyes because that's a dominance uh, behavior and it could be received by the wolves as a threat. And so you can watch them out of the corner of your eye and don't lose sight of them, but just walk away slowly. Don't run, uh, just walk. Um, if you feel threatened still yet, wolves have no idea what an object is that's thrown at them. And so pick up rocks, pick up sticks, keep a, you know, grab a club, um, throw things at them. Uh, they are going to retreat lickety split. And then the last thing I say to people, especially in our area where there's a lot of forests, is pretty much anybody can climb a tree. Uh, and wolves cannot climb trees. And so uh, while you may be inconvenienced for a while um, up in the tree, eventually the wolves will uh, get bored and leave and you can go on your way. Um, and so these are the things that um, I would suggest. Um, I've never had to resort to these kinds of things, but it's probably because I, I know wolf behavior and, and uh, I've never been in a situation, uh, including walking up to and pushing them off their, their deer kills, uh, where I have uh, felt threatened by wolves. In your area, uh, in the Pacific coastal states, wolves are now starting to come in on their own. And uh, so they're recovering and we call that colonization or recolonization. And the growth of, of the wolf population uh, in both Oregon and Washington has, has basically mirrored uh, one another. Uh, between the two of you right now, and this graph is a little bit old, there are probably around 350 wolves in uh, Washington and Oregon. And the last news reports I've seen is that there's still maybe two packs in California. And of course, part of that was uh, brought to you by your own wolf, OR7, who in 2009 uh, to 2011, I think, uh, took off and traversed right through the state of Oregon uh, from the, the, the uh, Blue Mountains in the Northeast down towards the Crater Lake country and then dipped down into California. Uh, and in any event, this is an example of what we call a jump disperser. And this is how wolves can colonize disparate areas, in other words, areas that are widely separated geographically from where other wolves are breeding. And so this is probably the fashion in which wolves will continue to gradually spread uh, in the uh, coastal states. As of a couple of years ago, wolf recovery had proceeded so well um, that the federal government is uh, uh, delisted wolves and they just now did it again. Each time they delist, unfortunately, uh, there are groups that sue, they usually win, and the federal government is, is forced to relist them. But in the upper Midwest, we have about 4,000 wolves. Wisconsin, which has the least habitat of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and upper Michigan, has over 1,000 wolves. Uh, in the northern Rockies area, there are about 1,500 wolves, probably closer maybe even to 2,000. And then, as I, I mentioned earlier, the Pacific coastal areas, you've probably got around 350 animals at this time. 
The uh, area I did not talk about is the uh, desert southwest. Um, that is an area that is, is occupied by a subspecies or a race of wolves called the Mexican wolf. And right now there are approximately 115 animals ranging in the Gila and uh, the Blue Range of, the, uh, of Arizona and New Mexico. And as you see, and we saw this in a different format uh, earlier, dispersers have reached a lot of states in between these areas. And uh, in some places, in all probability, there's not good habitat. For instance, our neighbor to the south of us in Wisconsin and in uh, Illinois uh, probably doesn't have great potential for any kind of wolf recovery because between the massive amount of humanity and the cornfields, um, pretty much all of Illinois is, is not considered to be real viable wolf habitat. But in any event, try as they might, they, these jump dispersers, they, they really don't know what is on the roadmap ahead of them. They just go. And this is what they do. So I am done with my talk, and I'm going to turn it back over to Laurel in a moment. But I just wanted to uh, suggest some readings for you. Um, these are some of the books that I would recommend. Uh, some of these, um, in this case here, uh, discuss the history of how wolves were wiped out of the uh, western United States. Um, and so Predatory Bureaucracy, The Last Stand of the Pack, Varmints and Victims, The Wolf in the Southwest, and then some contemporary readings, uh, two of which are actually for children, Wolf Called Wander and Journey, both discuss uh, the traversing of OR7 as he went through Oregon into California. And some of these are very readable, and some of them are probably what I would call technical. For instance, Doug Smith and Yellowstone Wolves, which just came out, I'm just kind of plowing through it myself. But in any event, um, uh, uh, I would suggest these if you've got some interest in reading more about wolves. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to Laurel, and I'm going to try and stop this and stay, stay tuned here. All right. One of the questions is, do you re recommend rain of, what is it, Kathy? Rain of at? I'm not sure. Um, Kathy, maybe if you want to specify. Uh, that's another person. I'm in Massachusetts and surprised there was a spot in Western Mass where there seemed to be wolves as of 2014. Though coyotes are established throughout the Massachusetts suburbs, do you think that the wolves may once again repopulate or overtake coyotes in suburbia. So that's the first part of the question. Okay, so the answer to that question is that was just a specimen that was hit. It, it is a single animal probably coming out of Canada. How it got across the St. Lawrence is amazing. Um, so it's a jump disperser from a population that's far removed from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, I would say you'd have to really, really, really hold your breath in Massachusetts for the arrival of wolves, especially in suburbia, uh, because there's no source population in that region of North America, uh, south of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And so uh, while there are a few barriers to wolf uh, dispersal, um, big rivers that are kept open through commerce during the winter months would basically be one of them. And so the St. Lawrence Seaway is kept open and that would deter any wolf uh, during the middle of winter from traversing through there. And of course, there's a lot of traffic during the non-winter months uh, in terms of ship travel and, and sailboats and you know, recreational things going on. So um, probably a very slim chance at wolves. I mean, you can never say never in science, but um, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't hold my breath um, that you'll see them in Massachusetts anytime soon. I could be wrong, but um, uh, as Monk used to say, I don't think so. so. <laughs> well, you said that they are just uh, generalists, can stay in many different habitats, but it sounds like highly populated areas in suburbia is just not, not one of the habitats that they're able to thrive in. And the is reason that right? for that is tolerance. Humans would not tolerate them there. All right, we have quite a few other questions. Um, should scientists take precautions when working with wolves to disguise themselves so they don't pass on human habituation to pups or other wolves? No. Um, generally, our close contact with wolves is very brief, and it's usually um, not a pleasant one for wolves. When you're going to 
catch a wolf, to put a radio on it. Uh, it's not a pleasant experience if you're the wolf. And so there's probably a reinforcement of that people are bad. Um, I've been working with wolves. I mean, I retired 10 years ago, but I worked with wolves for 35 years. And uh, um, I can tell you one thing, I, you know, we trap them here in, in the upper Midwest because our forests are too thick. Um, so they're leg hold traps. And, uh, and so when you dart them by putting a, um, a drug in their butt uh, to cause them to go to sleep, um, that's traumatic. And uh, I can tell you that the chance that you're going to ever catch that wolf again, it's not zero, but don't hold your breath on that one either because they are learning a PhD in how to trap uh, and what to avoid, and they want no part of it. So, no, I, I think, you know, in most cases, we're certainly trained on uh, not having those kinds of impacts in the, on animals in terms of habituation. Um, and um, none of the stuff that I'm aware of with wolf biologists would suggest that we're um, indirectly habituating them. Do you know what the chief prey of wolves is in Oregon by chance? Elk. Elk. Yep. Okay. And would you consider central Oregon hospitable habitat for wolves? I've only been in Oregon twice. I was supposed to come out to um, the High Desert Museum and do some training seminars with the International Wolf Center last March, but something called COVID struck and I wasn't able to do so. Um, there's a lot of good habitat in Oregon. I've been in there twice. I went from the Northeast to the Southwest. Um, and I also went from Portland down to Medford and then drove back up through Bend because I like Bend and, uh, and went back up to the Columbia Basin and headed back to Portland because I had to fly out, I had a wedding out there. Um, and um, so I've seen parts of the state and what I've seen um, habitat wise looks good. Um, but keep in mind, the wolves are going to select places where they're, it's fairly remote, but it has sufficient ungulates to keep them going because that's their fuel. And so I don't know anything about the distribution of, of elk or uh, black-tailed deer or mule deer and, and white-tailed deer in your state. Um, and uh, those would be the spots where you have all of that coming together where you would have a prob high probability that they'll eventually be there. Is there a color variation among wolves uh, based on variants or subspecies? Well, certain subspecies, which is kind of like a race, um, and our views on that as scientists are changing with the advent of, of DNA genetics, um, but certainly there are some regional populations where there's a preponderance of white, for instance, the high Arctic, and that makes sense. Um, in, in the uh, middle latitudes, such as here, um, there's a, a, a small distribution of, of totally black animals. And I had the occasion to work in the Yukon with Bob Hayes up there uh, back in the 1990s, uh, where we were uh, radio collaring wolves using helicopters. And uh, uh, it was rather interesting for me to see the color variations there from uh, the cinnamon browns that we typically see here in the upper Midwest to um, what I called silver, uh, not quite black, um, and everything in between. It was really neat. So um, it depends upon the genetics. It depends upon the region. Um, and uh, they are still wolves. They're, they're just canis lupus. And it's just like human beings come in different sh body shapes and sizes and colors. We're all human beings. And wolves are wolves. Okay. Um, have you heard of a book... Uh, called Reign of Wolf 7 and 21. Is that a book that you recognize? No? Could you repeat that? Reign of Wolf 7 and 21. Oh, um, the Reign of Wolf 8, is it? And 21. Oh, maybe that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's written um, uh, by uh, Rick McIntyre, who was the guru of wolves in Yellowstone in terms of the guy with the boots on the ground for probably a good 25 years. I haven't read the second book. I don't even have it, but the first book I read and I liked it. Um, it's a very good, um, um, he does a very good job of, of basically depicting wolf ecology in a national park. 
and yeah. uh, and it's very readable. Um, you know, it's 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 got nice little scientific facts, but they're infused in a narrative where you're not allergic to it. It's very very readable. So it's a good book. Good books. Good. Um, so does it take at least a male and a female jump disperser to establish a new population, or is it just one animal going out just trying? Well, as a mammal, you need a male and a female to reproduce, and so you need two of them. Um, and so generally what happens in, in all this, all these animals that are dispersing, it's both sexes. They just leave the natal pack. And whether it's a male or a female yearling, sometimes it could be a two-year-old. I've even seen some pups do that. Um, they leave and uh, they just wander about traversing, much like OR7 did, uh, until they bump into somebody of the opposite sex that was doing the same thing and they land up in the same space. Wolves also are uh, have a compatibility factor. I've seen that as well, where they don't get along with each other, even though they're a male and a female. It's kind of like a human. Um, and uh, your dogs. Um, and so um, eventually, you know, the right animal comes along. And if they've survived long enough in a, and stay put in a spot, that's when you start seeing these packs develop. And no matter where we study colonizing populations of wolves, uh, we see this. So all of Wisconsin, I started the wolf program when they were just starting to come into the state in 1980. And I already had a jump disperser pack it was 90 miles away from where I had two other packs. And we couldn't figure out how that was possible because we knew nothing about jump dispersal. We knew nothing about any of that stuff back then because that, the, that was where science was at back then. And now we know a lot because it's been repeated in Michigan. It's been repeated in Wisconsin, Yellowstone, um, and now certainly more recently in both Oregon and, and Washington, we're seeing the same patterns. And it's the same pattern, which is really cool because it's the same pattern. Wolves do this no matter where they are. That's really cool. I feel like in Oregon, we were all kind of captivated by OR7's journey. <laughs> were, were wolf biologists elsewhere also <laughs> captivated by this too? No. <laughs> we were kind of laughing in the upper Midwest because we'd been seeing wolves do that for 20 years. And what you were suffering from over there, which is beautiful, really, is the novelty of it all. Nobody ever seen that out west do something like that. And and uh, I just had an email from a Michigan biologist. Uh, I'm still in contact with all these people, even though I've been retired for 10 years, who showed me a jump disperser uh, who left upper Michigan uh, within the past year. Anyways, it walked right through Wisconsin, walked through the northeast suburbs of Minneapolis, St. Paul, went up to the northwest corner of their state, went into Manitoba, and went up past Winnipeg, turned around and started coming back, and unfortunately was killed illegally by a human when it came back into Minnesota. It had walked uh, 2,600 miles uh, in less than six months, I think it was. That's a jump disperser, and it's one of a litany of ones that we'd seen by the time OR7 started his, his journey. That does not mean that that's not remarkable. What OR7 did was open the eyes of people in the Pacific Northwest to the capabilities of wolves to colonize places that are a long ways away from where they started out. That's really something cool about wolves. Incidentally, uh, some other species do that as well, but that is amazing. I, I'm really struck by the fact that you were the first wolf biologist hired in your state in that the field was like so new and you've learned so much. I mean, how does that feel to look back and, and be able to see these patterns? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird because everybody, nobody ever thinks they're ever going to get old. Well, now I'm all of a sudden I'm, I'm old. <laughs> and, uh, and so now my lifetime is not ahead of me as much as it is behind me. Um, and, uh, uh, and some of my accomplishments, um, which incidentally have all been just happenstance and fun. Um, just, you know, I've just enjoyed what I've done and looking back at some of this stuff. Um, it's kind of neat to be able to say, well, I contributed to this incredible knowledge base that really was in its infancy when I started. And uh, there were other wolf biologists that had started before me, and there's still some around. Uh, Dr. David Meach whom I actually work with with the International Wolf Center. And incidentally, I forgot to mention that 
Uh, that's a really good format for anybody that wants factual information about wolves. That scientific base is the International Wolf Center. And you can just type in Google International Wolf Center and it'll pop up its web page. I'm on the board of directors with Dave Meach and with a bunch of others, and uh, we direct education programs. And our objective, incidentally, is not to pontificate about wolves. Our objective is to teach you about what we know about wolves and let you make up your mind as to whether you like them or dislike them or whatever your viewpoint is. But in any event, um, it's a go-to place for good scientific information about what wolves are, including the the you know, the downside, you know, conflict management and the conflict issues, as well as other things, you know, um, we don't, we don't hold back. This is, this is our job. I mean, paint the picture as it is and just be truthful. So anyways, yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> uh, well, okay. A couple other questions on your biology background. Are wolves considered to be an indicator species? Yes, it's a, that's an interesting concept. Uh, indicator species, for those of you that don't know, it would be an animal that you can kind of pin to a board and say, whatever happens to this animal is happening to a, an entire community or, or, or a, uh, an ecosystem. Um, and uh, um, yes, wolves can be done that way. Um, I, I, pref I, you know, professionally, I prefer not using animals or plants as indicator species. I don't, I just don't quite agree with that concept. Um, I just look at everything having value, no matter what it is. And uh, we don't need an indicator species to tell us something's wrong with a system when we know something's wrong with a system. Uh, and all of the parts, whether they're still there or some of them are absent, are all beautiful in their own right. And, um, and we need to pay attention. But yes, if you want to use indicator species, go for it. And wolves could be one. <laughs> Are, has there been any wolf migratory experience from Russia across the Bering Strait? The answer is no, um, because that is quite a gap right now. But uh, about 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, it wasn't a gap. And wolves were inter interchanging between the old world and the new world fairly freely during the last glaciation. And I think this will be the last question. Would there ever be a chance that wolves from Isle Royale or the Upper Peninsula in Michigan ever make it to the Lower Peninsula? Ha, huh, interesting. I'm not <laughs> expecting that from an Oregonian. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, not Isle Royale, but um, from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the gap um, is probably what it, uh, the, the Mackinac Bridge is probably eight, nine miles long. Uh, between connecting the lower peninsula with the upper peninsula, so the the um, the spread across um, Lake Michigan there is only eight or nine miles. The problem, of course, is uh, and incidentally, a wolf could swim that. That's swimmable. Um, but um, the problem is they usually would do it during the winter, and so you need ice. And of course, with climate change going on, it's been highly variable when the Great Lakes have been freezing over, um, and then you know, what is the condition of those ice shelves? I mean, I've had wolves uh, in my studies that have walked out onto ice, which they readily do, but unfortunately, you know, busted through and either died of exposure or drowning or a combination because they weren't able to extract themselves. So wolves will take those kinds of chances. Um, and so, you know, like I say, in the context of Massachusetts and the St. Lawrence, um, with the Lower Peninsula Michigan, the Upper Peninsula Michigan, you have to have the right conditions to get that to go. And it'll probably happen. Um, and in fact, there have been a few cases of wolves being killed in the lower part of the, uh, or the upper part of the Lower Peninsula in the last 20 years, but nothing re reproduced so far, but that could change. Isle Royal is on the other side of Lake Superior and very, very far removed from the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. It's only 15 miles off the Canadian border, and yet it's part of the United States. Um, so it's uh, and it's in the coldest lake that there is in the Great Lakes. Average temperature in most of Lake Superior during the summer is 42 degrees Fahrenheit, and most animals can't make it more than about seven or eight minutes in that water because they'll die of hypothermia. And believe me, we have people that die out there every year on kayaks that go in. I knew I had a friend who unfortunately met that fate. 
um, you hit that water and it's it's a life changing event. So it would be for a wolf as well. They they got out to Isle Royale by walking on the nice bridge, and we know that because uh, we've seen it subsequent a couple of times where they they traverse back and forth. So uh, the dynamics is very interesting. Well, they seem like they never cease to amaze, even though you can't tell their <laughs> patterns. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much, Dick Thiel, for joining us and sharing just some of the information that you know about wolves. It's been a great pleasure. And I want to thank you, all of you in the audience, for, jo for joining tonight's program and for your questions. Now, this program was recorded. A link will be sent out to all attendees. And if you know someone who would enjoy watching this, uh, please send them that link. The Deschutes Public Library has many wonderful programs that are all fun, free, and virtual. You can find those programs at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar or many recordings of these programs are on our YouTube channel. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Well, thank you very, very much. You all have a good evening. Take care now. <laughs>